Welcome to the CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives, the only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening, and now, enjoy the show. Johnson is always easier than virtue, for it takes the shortcut to everything. But that's only one kind of wickedness, the quick, open, obvious wickedness, like snatching a purse. There's another kind of wickedness, the slow, scheming, devious wickedness, wickedness that silently coils on itself like some gigantic serpent and waits with infinite patience for exactly the right moment to strike. You wouldn't commit murder. Why not? Because you and I are friends. Oh, I like you, Mr. Markowitz. I like you a lot. But business is business. But you're asking me to commit a crime. No, no. I'm only asking you the following question. Would you rather be dead and poor or alive and rich? <laughs> mystery drama, The High Priest, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Robert Dryden. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Today, we're to make the acquaintance of a Mr. Bennett Markowitz, a venerable gentleman, well in his 70s. Mr. Markowitz is very tall, very thin, with long white hair, a flowing white beard, and piercing black eyes. He looks for all the world like a prophet out of the Old Testament. However, he is actually an authority on art, specifically the paintings of Rembrandt. Bennett Markowitz is more than just an authority. Somehow, somewhere within him, seems to be the spirit of Rembrandt. As you know, Rembrandt painted many biblical characters, and so many of his models were the humble Jewish people of the Amsterdam ghetto. But enough. If you wanted a lecture on art, you would have gone to a museum. You tune us in for murder. And do we ever disappoint you? At 4.30... Friday afternoon, November 18th this year. And Mr. Martin J. Hollenbeck rang the bell off the premises of 598 East 54th Street. Mr. Hollenbeck. Well, it's 4.30, Mr. O'Neill, and here I am right on the button, primed and ready for the verdict. Well, won't you have a chair? Ah, thank you. Ah. Ah, yes, there is the painting set up on the easel. Aaron, high priest of Israel. Oh, oh, how those eyes seem to bore into your very soul. Oh, Mr. Hollenbeck is here, Mr. Markowitz. No one could do eyes like Rembrandt. You know, I get chills just looking at that painting. Um... Has uh, has Mr. Markowitz arrived at his decision? I believe he has. Oh, and what do you suppose it is? That's for Mr. Markowitz to say. Ah, Mr. Hollenbeck. Oh, good day, Mr. Markowitz. Good of you to come. Uh, Mr. Mr. Markowitz, I, I must know immediately for better or for worse. The, uh, the, the, the painting? Oh, uh, yes, the painting. The painting you have brought to me, which purports to be Aaron High Priest of Israel by Rembrandt. Von Rin. Rin. Purports to be. The painting is a fake. Oh, oh no, sir. It's the most unique 
fake I have ever seen. But, but, Mr. Markowitz, I... It is I... the work of a genius, but it is not a work of Rembrandt. But the style, the shadows, the light, and, and, and the paint and the canvas authenticated by carbon testing to be over 350 years old. No, these things can be faked if one is clever enough. Uh, who is the artist, Mr. Hollenbeck? What do you mean, who is the artist? He's Rembrandt. No, there are so many things out of joint in this painting, Mr. Hollenbeck. We shall start with the trivial and proceed to the serious. The breastplate ornament of the high priest, it should have 12 precious stones to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. There are only 10. Rembrandt was a serious scholar. Well, two of the tribes were lost. Not when Aaron was the high priest. Now, the face on the left, it's Ephraim Bonus, who was also painted by Rembrandt. Oh, yes, but it's a known fact that Rembrandt used actual people in the Amsterdam ghetto as his models. Not Mr. Bonus, who was a wealthy merchant. It's as if this artist devoured a host of details from scores of Rembrandt paintings and set them down. However, I might still accept it as a Rembrandt, were it not for one thing. Well, yes. A painting is more than form and line and color arranged on canvas. A painting that lives has something above and beyond all that. It has... Uh, the breath of life, the spirit that the artist has breathed into it. But, but surely, surely there's spirit in this painting? Yes, of course. But it is not the spirit of Rembrandt. The spirit which animates each artist's work is so uniquely his own. You, you see the things I have in this room? It was not necessary for Franz Hals to sign that portrait. We know, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that this dish was created by Cellini. On another level, this beautifully embossed matched set of pistols embodies the spirit of Hans Rasmussen. Uh, Mr. Markowitz, it's almost sundown. Well, no. Oh, yeah, but thank you. Uh, Mr. Hollenbeck, I fear I can only reiterate my statement... This painting is not the work of Rembrandt. Well, perhaps, but... but I'm also sorry that I must terminate our discussion. The Sabbath is about to begin, and it is not permitted to do or even to talk about business. The Sabbath? I'm an Orthodox Jew. I fear we have nothing more to talk about. <laughs> On uh, Monday evening, at about 10 p.m., Mr. Martin Hardback was sitting in Mary Mallow's piano bar on 3rd Avenue, near 64th, where he encountered a man named George Curly Peterson. Hello there, Holly. Oh, uh, do I know you? <laughs> you look at this bald head and you don't remember me. Why, it's Curly, yeah. Curly Peterson. Hey, that's right, Curly. Number 325289, and you were number 325276, yeah. and we were guests of the state. <laughs> I never forget a number. <laughs> what are you doing now, Curly? Oh, this and that. You? Me? <laughs> I thought I was sitting on top of a million bucks. A mill, huh? Now I have a painting. Could a painting be worth all that dough? Oh, if it's by Rembrandt. Is it by Rembrandt? It could be, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, here comes Mr. Buck. Yeah, I'm going to lose out. Well, maybe you had no business in a fine arts dodge anyhow. Why not? I prepared myself. Oh, yeah? Well, I took courses. I went to adult education classes. I, I studied speech, diction, so I wouldn't sound like some illiterate mug. And, and art appreciation. Go ahead, ask me any question on the rent house. I wouldn't know where to begin. And I picked up all the basics, believe me, the patter, and, well, beyond that, it's every man for himself. Uh -huh. Yeah, sounds to me like you set the pitch a no-hitter. No, I'm going to be knocked out of the box. Deal me in. I'll make it work. Ah, oh, Curly, nobody can make it work. Come on, fill me in. Go back to ground zero. Ground zero. Okay, we, uh... 
We have to start with a nut. <laughs> Who's the nut? Oh, that's what I asked Gracie Petrosky one night. We're sitting around her apartment. Who's the nut? Holly, look at this $10 bill. What about it? Real? Oh, yeah. You sure? Oh, uh-huh. let me really look. And? Yeah, that's on the level. It's queer. What? Hmm. Hey, this this is quality. Who's got them? It's a fortune. How much is there? This one ten spot is all there is. Oh, no. The last of the Mohicans. The plate was engraved for a friend of mine. But before he could get into production, the feds were tipped. They bagged him and destroyed the plate. You know, that plate was a work of art. I know the guy that designed the plate. Who is he? The nut from Bakerville. Who? He's a nut and he lives in Bakerville, Iowa. Well, would, would he make another plate? We could go there and ask. Do you, have you got his address? Address? It's a broken down farm in the middle of no place. No, Mr. Arenbeck. I am not engaged in engraving at this time. But your plates could make us a fortune. Money holds no interest for me. You see, I'm a nihilist. A what? Nihilism. The word was coined by Turgenev. Oh, yeah, but I, I, I would like to make Nihilism a... is a desire to overthrow not just the government, but all organized forms of society. And I am intent on destroying art. Well, yes, sure, sure, but... The but art first... establishment, the tyrannic or dictatorial art establishment, this self-appointed elite... That strangles all creativity. Look, just let me explain to you I how we could go. Expose uh, them, lay bare their obscene corruption. You see? Now look here. See? See what I have just finished? And yeah, what have you just finished? This canvas. <laughs> it's a masterwork. This is a Rembrandt. Rembrandt? <laughs> Where would you get a Rembrandt? Where? You fool, I painted it. Well, if you painted it, then it can't I be. I shall convince the establishment that it is. It is. I am the greatest painter who ever lived. Okay, if you're that great, why don't you sell your own? Oh, there's a lot against me, a conspiracy. My life is in danger. Oh, yeah, yes. Is, is, is that a fact? Oh, they all hate me, hate and fear me, all the other so-called artists. Because my work puts theirs to shame. <laughs> well, I can paint in any style. Rembrandt, Titian, El Greco, Michelangelo. Then there's a fortune. Oh, fortune, could... fortune. That's the only word you know. I'll bring this painting, this Rembrandt, that I have titled Aaron, High Priest of Israel, to the attention of the art world, and it will be hailed as a genuine Rembrandt. You sure of that? Yes, to me. Look. Well, I will be offered millions for it. And then, when they have committed themselves, these thieving parasites, (laughs) I shall laugh in their faces. Yeah, but... Why not just take the money and have a quiet laugh? No, money is evil. And uh, that's the painting you're trying to fob off? That's the painting. Well, uh, how'd you get rid of the nut? Oh, he, uh, he died. <laughs> I didn't know you were a muscle guy, Holly. Oh, no, no. It was, a, it was an accident. Ah. Uh-huh. Uh, then what happened? Well, then, Curly, I did all the things I told you about. Going to school so I could fit in with the art crowd. And and let me tell you, the nut was right about most of them. Well, uh, how'd you explain the way you found this painting? Oh, I made a deal with some dame who lived in Leiden. Leiden? Yeah, that's in Holland. Oh. She was to claim she found it in her attic. And then I just happened to come along. And how would she know it was a genuine Rembrandt? So she sold it to me for $2,000. Well, where do we stand right now? Oh, you got a lot of experts in Europe, and they all say, well, yes, perhaps, sure, maybe it could be. But before they'll jump, they're waiting for one man. Who? A certain Mr. Bennett Markowitz. But okay. When do we go up against Mr. Markowitz? Oh, I've already been there. And? He said no. Which means the ball game's over. What? Just because one solitary guy says no? He's the expert. You mean you just went in to see him cold? What else could I do? You, you, you didn't offer him a piece? Curly, the man is not on the tape. How do you know? Well, because... 
because he has an international reputation for integrity. Every living human being has his price. Well, he's different. Including he? your man, Markowitz. Let's uh, find out his price. Does every man have his price? In the end, can it be said that people may be bought and sold just like any other commodity? Or can it be said of certain human beings that they are incorruptible? I don't know. I just pose the question. Maybe we get the answer in Act Two. Well, now, uh, we were talking about buying and selling. And the product involved is honor. Yes, a man's honor. Would you bet your life on the absolute integrity of any human being? If you would, there are cynical people who'd say that you love to live dangerously. It was at the aforementioned uh, Marion Mallow's piano bar that uh, Martin Hollenbeck and Carly Peterson proceeded to create the scheme to be employed against Mr. Markowitz. Curry, I tell you, Mr. Markowitz is not on the take. How do you know? Did you ask him? Ask him? Well, it's the only way to find out. Curry, you don't know how far off base you are. There's only one way to find out. I do not wish to seem inhospitable, Mr. Hollenbeck. But I did say my final word on the subject last week. Well, uh, you may have said yours, sir, but I haven't said mine. Oh? Now consider one single word from you. That small but unbelievably powerful word, yes. And Aaron, high priest of Israel, will be accepted as a genuine Rembrandt. Oh, you overestimate my influence. One word from you, sir. And a painted canvas worth perhaps several hundred dollars as a curiosity becomes valued at several million as a masterpiece. Who is to say that the age of miracles has passed? Life itself is a miracle. Yes, indeed. And may I propose an arrangement? You want to bribe me? Oh, I offer you half a million dollars. For what? For that one word, yes. Yes, that's the word. That's... Not the word. What do you mean? Well, how can I put this? I believe in God, Mr. Hollenbeck. Well, don't we all? And in the covenant each of us makes with him. If we keep this covenant, we are rewarded. Not only in the next world, but in this world as well. Do you know what that reward is? Well, uh, actually, no, but... There's what so it? many ways to explain it, describe it, but for me, it's all contained in one word. And that word is peace. And that's the word you want me to sell. How much is that word worth? Well, Curry is not for sale. Okay, okay. What else do we know about him? What else? I'm looking for a way to get at this guy. Get at him? How? Well, uh, who else was there? Well, it was a secretary. What's her name? Miss uh, uh, O'Neill. Miss. I mean, she's not married. Uh, what does she look like? I don't know. Well, you were there. You saw the dame. What do you mean you don't know? Well... Since she's not the kind I'd want to make a pass at, I didn't really notice. So she's not the kind guys want to make a pass at. Well, we may have something. How old? Well, she could be, you know, 40. Miss O'Neill, eh? I wonder what I could get out of Miss O'Neill. Nobody could get a word out of Miss O'Neill. Well, that would depend on the kind of words you're after. <laughs> At no time, Monday, November 28th, George Curly Peterson rang the bell of the Markowitz establishment and thus became an active participant in the conspiracy. Yes? Oh, how do you do? Uh, 
I'm uh, working my way through college. I'll bet you are. <laughs> You'd lose. <laughs> I'm uh, really trying to raise money to uh, take a girl out tonight. Well, that's better. I'm uh, selling these vacuum cleaners. We have a vacuum cleaner. Oh, you shouldn't have said that. You should have let me in and had your rugs clean free of charge. Oh, uh, I don't believe in leading gentlemen on. Oh, but I'm no gentleman. Huh? What are you? A seducer. Is that a fact? Of girls who are young, innocent, and pretty. Oh, well, I'm safe. None of those adjectives describe me. No, you're an even greater danger since you are mature, wise, and beautiful. Oh, but I'm in no danger at all since, with your kind permission, I intend to close the door. Oh, oh one question first. Yes? Will you have dinner with me this evening? No. The place is hula hands. The Irish stew is legendary. Now say no. No. I forgot to tell you the address. The answer is still no. Ninth near 23rd, in case you should change your mind. Oh, this, this is magnificent. <laughs> I expected a little neighborhood bar deep in sawdust. Well, let's order the most expensive dishes, the best wines. Uh, do you wonder why I'm here? I swept you off your feet. <laughs> it's no great accomplishment. Almost anyone could do it. Well, then that's no compliment to either of us. Oh, I wasn't brought up on compliments. I was raised on the truth. The truth? I kept house for my father. Well, thus, the unmarried daughter had to stay home with the old folks. Yeah, which was a way to make sure she'd never marry. Well, my father was Sean Patrick O'Neill, the poet. Poet and philosopher. He died ten years ago, so... Well, I went to work for his good friend, Bennett Markowitz. From one saint to another. Oh, indeed, I breathed rarefied air all my life. Uh, what did you say your name was? Curly. Curly. Hmm? But uh, there are moments, oh, not many, but some, and not all the time, but occasionally when I... I want to breathe this kind of air. Well, go ahead and breathe it. <laughs> and this noontime, you caught me at just such a moment. Well, let's drink to that moment. And many others. I'm very happy for you, Maggie. Oh, isn't he wonderful? He knows nothing at all of poetry or painting or philosophy. Well, I can learn. You do and you'll have seen the last of me. Well, maybe it's too late. It's never too late to learn some of the greatest philosophy in the world. And now, Bennett, you're going to get started and spoil it for us. It's also the shortest philosophy. How short? One of the great sages was once challenged to recite the wisdom of the Talmud while standing on one foot. Oh, such a challenge would be more fitting for an acrobat. Well, he did it. He said it all comes down to this. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Oh, you, you mean that's all there is to philosophy? That's the kernel. Everything else forms the shell. Oh, excuse me. Hello? Yes? Who? Oh, are you sure? Well, yes, I suppose it must be true. No, no, I'll, I'll tell her myself. Thank you. I would assume that we have received bad news, my dear. Oh, Mr. Markowitz, this is awful. I don't know what to say. That, that was Mr. McHugh from the island. Oh, I hope there's nothing wrong with his cottage. Everything's wrong. It, it burned down. Oh. Something about the electrical circuits. Oh, well, that's, that's too bad. Oh, is that all you can say? Mr. Markowitz spends a week alone at McHugh's seashore cottage every year. Oh, in December? It's a time for solitude and communion with the sea and the sky. Uh, well, does Mr. McHugh have another accommodation? Oh, nothing with heat, or as he puts it, winterized. Oh, Mr. Markowitz, I, I know how disappointed you must be. It is said man appoints, God disappoints, and for his own purpose... Perhaps it was ordained that I should not spend my week at the shore this year. Oh, I know you're putting on a good oh, 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 face. Would, would, you, would you mind if I, uh, if I say something? 
Now, you talk about something being ordained. Well, maybe it was ordained that I should meet Maggie. For a lot of reasons. And one of them is that I would be here when you got that phone call. Now, what are you saying? Well, don't you see? Mr. Markowitz, uh, I could be talking out of turn, but uh, would you maybe consider spending a week out at uh, my place? Your place? I have this uh, cottage on the uh, south, south shore, right on the beach. Oh, well, I couldn't imagine. Oh, it's just it... what you want. It belonged to my folks, and they died. But I never used it. Uh, it was just an old fellow up there, uh, old, old Frank. He takes care of the place. It just goes to waste. Is there uh, any reason why you shouldn't go? You want me to rent a beach cottage out on the South Shore? Why? Because Mr. Markowitz is going to spend a week by himself communing at the shore. He will return home, and he's going to invite some critics and other high brows to his place where he will make the following announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, I have been haunted... Is that a good word to use? Curly, I don't know what you're driving at. I have been haunted by a painting called Aaron, High Priest of Israel. I am convinced, beyond a shadow of a doubt, it is a genuine Rembrandt. He's going to say that? I guarantee it. But, but how? That's the plan. What plan? What plan, indeed? We have seen that bribery is futile. Muscle? We've been inclined to doubt its effectiveness in this type of situation. And yet, Curly, who is apparently an extremely resourceful gentleman, seems supremely competent. What is the plan? Well, you know perfectly well you'll have to wait for Act Three. He harms himself, who does harm to another. And the evil plan is most harmful to the planner. Hmm, perhaps... Another way to put it is, you can't get away with murder. But, unfortunately, there are those who obviously do. Up for our consideration is a plan, certainly an evil one, being concocted by Curly Peterson and Martin Hollenbeck. All of it is a part of a record, a police record. On December 15th, the perpetrators, Hollenbeck and Peterson... Matt in Peterson's apartment to plan the next stage of the plot against Bennett Markowitz. Here, for the first time, we meet the third member of the group, Mr. Frank Leroy. You, you mean Markowitz is going to come back from the shore and say the painting is a Rembrandt? Absolutely. Well, you've got to show me how. Yeah, sit still for a moment. Uh, won't you come in, sir? Why? Oh, why, it's, it's Mr. Markowitz. I, sir, I... See? I, uh, it works. I, I don't understand. <laughs> Suppose I said, I know a guy who could be the spitting image of Bennett Markowitz. You'd say, it's impossible. It won't work. But you see, I spring him on you and you just naturally accept it. You mean this is... Suppose I said to you, remember a pen pal of ours who used to be an old-time matinee star and was doing 30 years for killing his wife? No, no, no wait, a, wait a minute, sir. Suppose sorry, is... I said to you, we could get Frank Leroy to impersonate Bennett Markowitz. You mean this is Frankie the actor? If I said that to you, you would say to me, never, no way, it couldn't work. <laughs> What do you say now? What? I, I can't believe it. You're Frankie. <laughs> Nothing to it, Holly. Point the nose a bit, build out the chin, some slight shadow under the eyes. And I'm Markowitz. Yeah. Only uh, that that's not Markowitz's voice. Nah, I can get his voice. Hey, he'll spend a week with Markowitz in the cottage as Frank the Handyman. He, he, give us a little uh, apple locker there, Frank. Can I offer you a cup of tea, Mr. Markowitz, with just a touch of Jack? <laughs> hey, hey, huh? He'll study every move, every gesture. He will actually become Bennett Markowitz. <laughs> sure, sure. It sounds good, but... Uh, but what? 
Well, I don't know. A great many people know Markowitz. I mean, Frankie can't be prepared for everything for everybody. Oh, that's where you're wrong. Practically nobody knows Markowitz. He's, uh... Uh, what's a guy who stays by himself? Uh, a recluse. Yeah, but the girl Maggie, can he fool her? Well, he can. For five minutes. What do you mean, five minutes? Well, that's as long as the show lasts. Five minutes, that's all we need. I don't understand. All right, step by step. Markowitz leaves for the seashore. A week later, Frankie returns to town as Markowitz. Oh, where's Markowitz? He's still at the shore. Doing what? Looking down the barrel of a gun you're holding on him. Oh, well... All right, now just stay with me. I call Maggie. I say Markowitz asked me to drive him back to town. He wants to call a press conference. She's to invite the critics, reporters, experts, whoever. Yeah, but I still don't follow... I show up with Frankie the actor who plays Markowitz. I, I think he's good enough to fool even her for a while. But the insurance is, I keep away from her all week. She misses me terribly. That's what it all rests on. She misses me so bad, she only has eyes for me. She doesn't really care about Markowitz when we walk in. Oh, come on, Cuddy. What are you talking about? I find it hard to accept. <laughs> hard to accept that she uh, can't wait to be alone with me. Oh. <laughs> so, Frankie here is Markowitz, makes the announcement, and he's very tired, wants to retire, wants to go back to the seashore and commune some more with wild and savage nature. He exits, and he's never seen alive again. What do you mean? Well, a couple of days later, Frank, the handyman, is in a state. He warned old Bennett Markowitz to keep away from the boat, even though the sea may look calm. Sudden squalls spring up. Well, boat is found, drifting, empty. And uh, later on, poor Mr. Markowitz's body is found, washed up on the shore. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, we have to kill him. If he lives, he'll blow the whistle. Such a nice old guy. Yeah, how much longer could he last, anyhow? On December 19, Martin Hollenbeck rented a cottage from Gaia Realty in Closet, Suffolk County, Long Island. Well... What do you think? It's... It's magnificent. I knew you'd like it. The sea, the sky, the sun, the air. How clear, how clean. Oh, this beauty. This is what God gives us. And to what purpose do we defile it? And the house. Wait till you see the inside. Ah, I see Frank has a fire going. Good. I'll call him. Uh, Frankie? What a charming place. This is the gentleman that's going to be staying? Uh, Mr. Markowitz, uh, this is Frank. How do you do, Frank? May I offer you both a cup of tea with just a touch of Jack? <laughs> Frank, let your conscience be your guide. Late that afternoon, Cady Peterson returned to the city. Four days later, he came back to the cottage to check out the progress of the plan. Mr. Markowitz, are you home? We wish you in a moment, Curdy. How do you like me as Markowitz? Frank, then it was you who just answered me? Yes, I cannot tell a lie. It was I. Where, uh, where is Markowitz? Out somewhere, communing with nature. He's having a great time. Yeah, but when you said, be with you in a moment, Curly, <laughs> Frank, I could have bet my life. <laughs> what can I say? I'm the old master. You got him. Perfectly. If only you knew how perfectly. He's He's got that slight upward inflection. He speaks in balanced phrases. Sometimes as if he's had a conversation with himself. He asks questions and answers them. What is art? The imagination of God. We pursue it in vain. It eludes us always. That's him. That's him. Frank, I look. I listen. I get chills. That's the secret of acting. <laughs> 
Art, acting, philosophy. What's a mug like me doing on such an intellectual caper? Kelly, you're the brains. On December 29, Martin Hollenbeck and Curry Peterson drove out to the cottage. They were convinced. They were now fully prepared to place the final stage of the plan in operation. Hello, Curly. This is an unexpected surprise. I see you brought a guest. I believe you know Martin Hollenbeck. Well, we we meet again, Mr. Markowitz. Martin Hollenbeck? What are you doing here? You'll need a companion for the next few days. I'm afraid I don't understand. Maybe you never will. Frank. Frank. Come in here. Now, Mr. Markowitz, uh, do us the kindness to remain seated. The chair is comfortable. Well, Frank. Who? Who is he? You can see. (laughs) He's your alter ego. You from tip to toe, Mr. Markowitz. I, I see. Oh, now, Mr. Markowitz, you haven't seen anything yet. Well, here's what we find out. This is it. Pick up the phone and uh, dial the number, Frank. Just uh, remember what you have to say. I never forgot a line in my life. Hello? Maggie? How are you, Mr. Markowitz? Oh, fine, my dear. Uh, Maggie, I've been thinking... Uh, Perhaps it was the sky, the colors of the clouds, the tones of the sea. Suddenly I realized a great truth in a magnificent burst of insight. What, What was it? I know now that Aaron, high priest of Israel, was painted by Rembrandt. Are you sure? My dear... This is not mere knowing. This is the feeling that resides in the heart. The painting is real. Oh, that's wonderful. Another Rembrandt. I shall return tomorrow. Call the newspapers, the magazines, and so forth. I will hold a press conference at the house at two in the afternoon. A press conference at two? Curly has kindly consented to drive me into town. Then I shall get to see Curly tomorrow. Of course. Well, until tomorrow, Mr. Markowitz. Until tomorrow. Do you think you can get away with this, this monstrous charade? Look at Frank. Listen to Frank. Do you know any way we can miss? Maggie... Maggie knows me too well. She'll look at him and see something wrong. Maybe, but she's not going to be looking at him. She's going to be looking at me. At 1.45 on the 28th, Frank Leroy, perfectly disguised as Bennett Markowitz, accompanied by Carly Peterson drove up to the Markowitz house. My dear, have you notified the press? Yes, Mr. Markowitz. They'll be here. Oh, Curly. How have you been, baby? Oh, lonesome. Oh, Maggie, my dear, do you suppose I might have a small glass of wine? Oh, of course. I'll be right back. Well, fantastic. She bought you. Is there ever any doubt? Oh, this crazy scheme, it's going to work. We'll be worth millions. And so therefore, ladies and gentlemen of the press, there is no doubt in my mind that Aaron, high priest of Israel, is an authentic Rembrandt. Ladies and gentlemen, if you will excuse Mr. Markowitz for the present... I'm sure you understand. Oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. All right. Curly? Hmm? What is it? I, uh, I... What's the matter? Something wrong? No, I don't think so. It's just... Just what? He's, uh, 
Something bothering you, my dear? Uh, no. Uh, you sure you're okay? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm okay now. Great, great. For a minute you had me worried. Uh, Mr. Markowitz, while you were gone, a man called about those Rosmussen pistols. Yes? If he wanted to know if they were in working order. And, uh, what did you tell him? Oh, that they worked perfectly, and I... I even put cartridges in them. Oh, they work. Look at the ceiling. Maggie, what the... Now that you know these pistols are loaded, raise your hands. Oh, Maggie, have you taken leave Keep of your... Keep your mouth shut and your hands up while I call the police. At 2.35 p.m., a patrol car responded to a call for help. From Miss Maggie O'Neill, who was holding the perpetrators at the point of a pistol. Suffolk County police were notified, and Mr. Bennett Markowitz was released, and the perpetrator Hollenbeck taken into custody. I uh, asked Miss Maggie O'Neill, how did you know Frank Leroy was not Bennett Markowitz? Well, at first, I didn't. Suddenly, something bothered me, and it kept bothering me. I didn't know why. He looked exactly like Mr. Markowitz. His voice, his mannerisms, everything was Mr. Markowitz. Still, something bothered me. What? And then I remembered. When I opened the door to the street to let him in, he entered the house without pausing to touch the mezuzah. The what? The mezuzah. It's a tiny metal plaque fixed to the doorpost of every Orthodox Jewish house. Now, inside it is a parchment inscribed with a text from Deuteronomy and the sacred name of the Lord. And, uh, he didn't touch it? Well, it is the custom to bestow a kiss upon it when entering or leaving the house. The fingers brush the lips and then lightly and lovingly touch the mezuzah. A man who did not do that could not be Bennett Markowitz. And so it is with every counterfeit. No matter how careful and competent the forger, he must make his mistake. Because all he can hope to capture is the substance. It's the shadow, the all-important shadow that always must elude him. I shall return shortly. The sudden stab of recognition. The flash of insight that illuminates every detail of the hitherto hidden landscape. This is how a complex plan was revealed to Curly Peterson. The absence of a familiar routine gesture. This is how a truth was revealed to Maggie O'Neill. I understand that Curly was only sent up for ten years... He writes to Maggie every day, and she returns his letters unopened. Our cast included Robert Dryden, Bryna Rayburn, Ian Martin, and William Griffiths. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Sinoff, the sinus medicines. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. I hope you enjoy this episode of CBS Radio Mystery Theater. If you enjoyed this and want to hear more, please subscribe to this channel. You can also visit my other YouTube channel by searching Mr. Brian McCarthy in the YouTube search bar.